Last time, this is where we left off. And we were saying that the reason there is this curve in this line, which represents all the possible portfolios you could make of these two things, that has a curve because of the diversification benefit. And I showed you that all we have to have is less than perfect positive correlation in order for us to have this benefit. And so it turns out that this correlation is going to impact the severity of the curve of that line. The lower the correlation is, the more severe that bend is going to be. And so our correlation in this case was a um, little, uh, little less than zero. So you can see how much bend that's going to put in the line. Now, let's talk about what these other things might represent. In fact, let's skip on out to negative one. If my horizontal axis is standard deviation, which is my measure of risk, and I've got a line over there at zero, what does it tell me about that portfolio that you can see right there on the, on the vertical, it touches the vertical axis? Mr. Rosen. What kind of risk is that portfolio experiencing? Yeah, it's zero, right? It's over there on the horizontal axis, or on the vertical axis, it's zero. And so what we're saying here is it is possible to have a portfolio, it's theoretically possible, to have a portfolio that will have a positive return greater than the risk-free rate and zero risk. But it's all dependent on finding two things with positive expected returns that are perfectly negatively correlated. And what did we say last time about the possibility of finding that? Gone. Yeah, it's not going to happen. And so this is a nice theoretical thing. And it works out really well on the exam when I ask you what's the best possible correlation to have to achieve diversification benefit. The answer is negative one. All too often, students select zero, but it's actually negative one. The lower you go, the better off you are. Okay, any questions about this? <clears throat> okay, now we're going to take that thought that we had, and we're looking at super tech and slow poke, and we're going to apply it to country portfolios, because it turns out that you could just be looking at two portfolios and you could look at their expected returns, standard deviations and correlations and come up with some, something similar. And so we see here we have 100% US and 100% foreign for portfolios. Which one of those, uh, which one of those portfolios is safer? Yeah, the US. Now, what do we know about the relationship between risk and reward? More risk, more reward. So these foreign portfolios, uh, they've got a higher reward, but it must be because they are more risky. So let's talk about what makes foreign portfolios risky. And by the way, if you're not from the United States, I apologize for our use of the term foreign. Right? We're talking about everything else except for the U.S. So let's talk about that. First of all, we know that developed economies are safer than developing economies. The United States is a developed economy. Secondly, we know that the institutions and the rule of law are important to making investing safe. In the United States, we have, no, they're not perfect, but we have fairly good institutions. If you uh, get ripped off, you can go to court and you can expect reasonably to get fair treatment there. As opposed to some other countries where, uh, I'm just going to call out Mexico here, uh, the Conviction rate for murder in Mexico is 2%. <clears throat> Do you think that 98% of the people they accuse of murder are innocent? No. What do you think is going on there? Oh, come on. Yeah. The, uh, the, the judges can be paid off, right? Does that make sense? And so as a result, it's the best justice money can buy. And if I, as a small shareholder, am going up against the big bad majority shareholder, who's going to win? The big bad majority, share, majority shareholder. And so that's another one. And then we have political risk. Political risk. Um, so here in the United States, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, our politics are an absolute mess. But we do tend to be 
fairly stable compared to other countries. I'm going to give you the example of Venezuela. Venezuela, they uh, go through phases and they will be getting rich. So they'll adopt capitalism and then they'll start to get richer as a people. Everybody's better off. But then someone notices, usually a politician, then someone notices that some people are getting rich faster than others are being lifted out of poverty. And so this whole co this wealth gap thing shows up. And so then what do politicians always do? They take advantage of it. By the way, are there more poor people or rich people? Poor people. Poor people. Poor people get one vote, rich person gets one vote, right? And so if I want to be popular as a politician, all I have to do is say we're going to take from the rich and give to the poor. That's called socialism, right? So that's what they say. We're going to do that. And then they get elected. And then they start nationalizing industries, assets, and whatnot. My dad had some stock in a company called Texas International back in the mid-70s when Venezuela did one of these socialist flops. He lost all of his money in that investment. Now, uh, eventually what's going to happen, and it's taken them longer than usual this time, but eventually they will figure out that socialism <coughs> just makes everybody poor. By the way, that's how, you get, uh, that's how you get income equality, right? You make everybody poor. Uh, so now what are they going to do? Eventually they will turn back to capitalism and then everybody will be better off. But then at some point, what will happen? They'll figure out again that the rich are getting rich faster than the poor are getting rich, right? And so then, once again, there will be a politician that comes out and does this. It's like a 20-year cycle. I was giving this talk one time, and I had a student from Argentina. And she said, she laughed. I said, what's going on? And she says, my country does it every 10 years. Right? But it's a cycle. And so if I'm going to invest in Venezuela, I have to invest understanding that there is a high probability that at some point, the government is going to nationalize, which is also called stealing. They're going to steal these assets that I've invested in there and I won't get any money for them. And so this is one of those things we have to look out for. In the United States, we have a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as, as we do in some of these developing economies. Now, all I said tells us that we have the United States portfolio, which is not returning as much, but not nearly as risky. We have the foreign assets, which are returning more and they're, because they're more risky, which I've already told you why. Now, here's the fun thing. The United States portfolio is not perfectly positively correlated with the foreign stock portfolio. So why would that be? Currency. Okay, so there's currency swings. Um, also, are all the economies in the world perfectly positively correlated? No. Uh, so I'll give you an example here, and this goes back and forth with Russia and the United States, but typically when uh, oil prices are high, it's good for Russia, bad for the United States. And so they'll move in somewhat opposite directions. Uh, and then let's talk about um, the price of gold. Some countries have lots of uh, gold that they can mine, and during times of high gold prices, they're actually better off. What about the key consumers of gold, which would be India and China? An increase in the price of gold would be bad for them. And so what we see is all of these economies across the world, it would really be hard to find two that were perfectly positively correlated, not even the US and Canada. And so what's gonna happen here is that's gonna give us the ability to diversify by investing in these foreign stocks because the economies they represent are not perfectly positively correlated with the U.S. economy. Now, let's talk about this. Once again, we call this line the, uh, well, this, the whole line is the opportunity set. Can anybody tell me where the efficient set is on this drawing? I'll give you a hint. Yeah, yeah, it's the 80-20 starting there and then going all the way over to a total foreign portfolio. And the reason we say that that efficient set is efficient is because even though these uh, portfolios down here on the bottom are possible, they're not efficient because I could always uh, add a little foreign stock and both reduce risk and increase returns. I would have to be crazy to be invested in 100% U.S. stocks. Now, the first time I gave this talk, I looked up and I realized, I'm crazy. 
right? Because I had was invested totally 100% U.S. stocks at the time. So what did I immediately go out and do? I immediately went out and diversified my portfolio to be this minimum variance portfolio, 80% U.S., 20% foreign. And uh, I've got it set up on my birthday every year that my, uh, my investments rebalance so that if the U.S. stocks have done a little better than foreign stocks, then I'll sell off some U.S. and buy foreign and vice versa. And by the way, what does that mean? It means I'm selling high and buying low. So that's kind of cool. Over the long term, though, I know I will be so much better off. It's really hard to, for anyone that doesn't understand how diversification works to understand this. My dad's a smart man, but correlation and covariance are not in his wheelhouse. And so the idea that you could make something safer by sprinkling risky stuff into the recipe just doesn't compute. And so this is a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but it's an amazing thing, this diversification. Any questions so far? What's going to drive you along that efficient set between a minimum variance portfolio and foreign? What did we say last time was going to drive you along that efficient set? Risk aversion. Yeah, risk aversion. And we said risk aversion varied by age, age and also what else? Gender. Yeah, gender. And then, of course, there are other things. Um, when you grow up on the farm and you're uh, whether you're going to get to go to college next semester has to do with whether it rains or not. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things that play into it from your background. Okay, so risk aversion is going to push me along. Where would a 19-year-old um, billionaire be on that line? Are they going to be really risk averse? A 19-year-old male billionaire, where would they be? Probably like 20 U.S. and uh, pro yeah, pro oh, probably at toward the end there, right? Because these are the same morons that were like, how did he get the billion to begin with? Cryptocurrency. And how much money does he have now? Five dollars, right? Because, well, anyway, it, it just took it down. My point to you is that's what's going to drive people along here. Now, really risk averse people should be down here at the 80 U.S. 20 percent foreign, but they should definitely not be at the 100 U.S. 0 percent foreign. They're leaving money on the table. Questions? Okay, now, uh, it turns out that there are more than just two assets or two portfolios on the planet. We can actually extend this thing to many, many, many assets. And it turns out that entire blue field is all the possible portfolios that you could possibly make using the risky assets that are known to man. So that's everything. Everything is in that blue area. Now, there is a special place along that blue area, though, that we call the efficient frontier. It's no longer the efficient set, it's the efficient frontier. And the efficient frontier here is, um, I would call that baby poop brown in that picture. It's that icky color of brown that's right along the edge there. Now, why would Portfolio R be better than Portfolio W, Ms. Knight. Because there's a higher return, but it's the same risk. Yeah, it's a higher return for the same risk. And we can look at any of these portfolios, one, two, or three. And we can either go up to get more return for the same risk, or we can go left and get the same return for less risk. And so none of portfolios W, 1, 2, or 3 are efficient portfolios because we can always move to that line, the efficient frontier, and do better. Does that make sense? Now I want you to notice something else here as we move along, and, and once again we're going to be driven along this thing by risk aversion. As you move away from the minimum variance portfolio, the slope of that line is pretty steep. So that means for each little bit of additional risk that you take on, you get some fairly significant rewards. But notice as we get out closer to uh, point X that this thing starts to get more shallow. So I have to take on a larger and larger, a larger amount of risk to get the same increase in return. This is a problem, and we're going to talk about how we're going to solve that. Any questions so far?
Okay, now this is state of the art up to about 1963 or so when someone says, wait a minute, there aren't just risky assets out there, there are, there's also the risk-free asset. Ms. Pomeroy, what is our stand-in for the risk-free asset? I don't know. Ms. Rafael, what is our stand-in for the risk-free asset? Uh, government treasury bills, right? Government bonds have a long time to maturity, so the 30 years. Treasury bills only have that three months, so they don't have the price risk that bonds do. Okay, so that's going to be our stand-in for the risk-free asset. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to put this theoretical risk-free asset here on this uh, picture. And we are going to say that the standard deviation of the risk-free asset is zero. Ms. Minahan, why would the standard deviation of returns on the risk-free asset be zero? Um, because when you subtract from the risk-free asset, like that's what we use to... Okay, let, let, listen to my question one more time. Okay. Why would the standard deviation of returns for the risk-free asset be zero? I'll give you a hint, it's in the name. It's the oh, it's risk-free, risk right? It's risk-free, so the standard deviation of this thing uh, returns on it should, in theory, be zero because, after all, standard deviation is a measure of risk. Okay, so we're going to put that on this line here at a standard deviation of zero, and the return on this thing is the risk-free rate. And so now I have a possibility of investing um, along any line that runs through that risk-free asset and the field of risky assets. And so I'm just going to pretend that I've got a pen over here on this uh, vertical axis and I'm going to start rotating that thing upward. Why am I rotating it upward? Because the greater the slope on that line, the more return I get for each additional unit of risk that I take on. Let me say that again. I want that line to be as steep as I possibly can get it because the slope on that thing is the change in return for every unit of risk you take on. So I want to get the absolute most change in return, increase in return, as I can for each additional unit of risk that I take on. So I'm going to keep cranking this thing up and cranking it up, cranking up until it touches at exactly one point. And the word for that is tangent. Tangent means touching at just one point. That is the highest uh, slope line that I can get that touches both the risk-free asset and this uh, feel of all possible risky portfolios. Now, it turns out we have a special name for that weird little portfolio that's right there on the edge. We call it the market portfolio. We call it the market portfolio. And let me tell you what the market portfolio represents. Get ready to write this down. The market portfolio is every risky asset known to man, every risky asset known to man, every risky asset known to man, held in proportion, held in proportion, held in proportion to its value in the world economy. Held in proportion to its value in the world economy. Held in proportion to its value in the world economy. So, let's talk about this. Are stocks risky assets? Yes. yes. Every single stock in the whole world is in that portfolio. Are bonds risky assets? No. Yes, in fact they are. Remember we said that there is default risk and there's price risk on bonds. Now they're not as risky as stocks, but they're still risky. And so every single bond known to man needs to be in that portfolio. Now let's get down to some things that you might not be able to go out and buy. What about houses? Are houses risky assets? Yeah. yeah. It's so funny when I gave this talk prior to 2006. 
I would say, is house a risky investment? And the students would always say, no, because house prices always go up. Then I'm giving this talk in 2009, and my students say, oh yeah, house prices always go down, right? The truth is somewhere in between, but we know that therefore prices move up and down, and we know that this roughness is risk, therefore the house is a risky asset. Now my question to you is, could you buy shares in my house? No. There are only two people that own equity in my house, my wife and me. That's it. And we're not selling shares. So you guys can't like, you know, get buy a room from us. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so my point to you in telling you this is, though we had this theoretical market portfolio that is every single risky asset known to man, you can't invest in it. And we certainly could not figure out what the returns on that portfolio were simply because we don't have constant fresh market prices on all these risky assets. For example, I bought my house in 2007. I paid $354,500 for it. That is the last market value um, dot that we have on that. Anything, and you say, well, wait a minute, you could go out and look at Zillow or Red Blue Fin or Red Bubble, whatever it is. You could go out there and look, but would that be a true market value? No. It's a guess. It's a swag, right? And even if you have someone come out and appraise your property, that's still just a scientific wild ass guess. Only an actual sale can set that market price. And so what I'm telling you is you can't invest in all the things of the, this portfolio. And even if you could, or even if you could, we don't have fresh prices on all of them. So we really can't tell you what this is. So it's a theoretical construct that can't be proven or disproven. So this leaves us, by the way, this causes fights. There was a guy named Richard Roll, still alive, I think. And uh, he had a critique of this capital asset pricing model, which is what we're looking at here. And he says, well, you can't prove or disprove this thing because we really can't get good, me uh, good measurement on this market portfolio. By the way, what do you think? We know we can't actually have a risk-free asset, but we have a close stand-in, the three-month treasury bill. We can't really have the market for portfolio, but what do you think we do in the U.S. as a stand-in for this? Any ideas? In the U.S., we use the S&P 500. In the U.S., we use the S&P 500. And why do we use the S&P 500? Well, first of all, it's 500 stocks, right? Uh, and so it's, it's well diversified. It's got a bunch of risky assets in it. It tends to be the 500 most important stocks, if you want to think of it that way. It's also designed to replicate what's going on in the U.S. economy. Now, we've been talking about the world here. So now we've got two US-centric things. We've got the S&P 500 as our stand-in for the market portfolio, and we've got the United States three-month treasury bill as our stand-in for the risk-free asset. One time I was doing a research on the Chinese stock market, and I had used the US risk-free asset as my risk-free rate, and the reviewer, who was undoubtedly Chinese, told me, no. He says, no. He says, for Chinese studies, we always use, and he gave me this People's Bank of China rate that they use for their risk-free rate. So this is a US-centric class. I apologize for that. But what I'm telling you is our stand-in for the risk-free rate is the three-month US Treasury yield, and our stand-in for the market portfolio is the S&P 500. Now let's talk about some other things along here. We know that if you've got these two um, assets that you can invest in, that everything between risk-free asset and the market portfolio represents a combination of the two. And something I didn't tell you last time, but it's really important, is that portfolio weights always must add to one. Portfolio weights always must add to one. Portfolio weights always must add to one. And so if you look at something uh, it's like Portfolio 4, Portfolio 4 might be 60% risk-free asset, 40% market portfolio. And so those would add to 100% or 1. And anything along there will be the same. 
But take a look at what happens here. What do you think? How do you think uh, portfolio five is possible? If the weights have to add to one, and we know we get out past A, now we've got more than 100% market portfolio, how is that possible? What must be true of the weight on the risk-free asset? If I've got 120% uh, of, yeah, it's got to be negative. And so the weight has to be negative. If I've got 120% in the market portfolio, I've got to have negative 20% of the risk-free asset. Now, how can I have negative 20% risk-free asset? Well, let's think back to what the risk-free asset is. You're loaning money at the risk-free rate. What's the opposite of loaning money? Oh, come on, you guys should have this. What's the opposite of loaning money? Borrowing, right? And so basically, I can go out there and borrow money, and as long as I'm uh, borrowing money at the risk-free rate, then I can stay on that line. And by the way, we have a name for that line. Do you see it says line two, but it's actually the capital market line. That's our fancy finance name for that line. It's the capital market line. Now, I can borrow roughly at the risk-free rate. I know it doesn't sound like you could because after all, you're not the United States government, but the answer lies with something called margin accounts with your broker. Anybody know what a margin account is? It's where your broker will loan you money to allow you to buy stocks. And they'll uh, loan you that money at a fairly low interest rate. How can they get by with charging you so very little interest? You say, I'm not the United States government. Well, the answer is that they're sitting there on your portfolio. And if your portfolio starts to look like it's going to risk going below the amount of money you owe on it, what can they do? Yeah, they're going to sell your stock to pay off your debt. So as long as uh, the values don't go to zero overnight, then the brokerage can handle these things without a problem. So it's very, very little risk for them in this whole thing. By the way, am I recommending that you invest out of 0.5? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would not. So frankly, where am I in this whole thing? Uh, I'm at point A. I'm at point A. Um, where is my mom? I'll give you a hint. She's 82 and female. Where do you think she's at? Yeah, she's all the way over here to the left, right? She's all the way over at the risk-free asset. Now, the, the next cool thing about this situation is we know we're getting the absolute most risk we can, or most return we can for the level of risk we're taking on. And the next thing is, this makes your investing decisions quite simple. It makes your investing decisions quite simple. It separates your risk aversion from what the different stocks you should be holding. Remember, previously we were pushing along that efficient frontier, and so each one of those dots would represent a different portfolio of risky stocks. But here, there's only one portfolio of risky stocks that anybody's interested in owning, and that is the market portfolio. And then your risk aversion, all it does is it impacts how much of that risk-free asset you're going to hold versus the market portfolio. And so this is really an amazing thing. It makes investing way, way easy, which explains why I have basically S&P 500 for the overall majority of my portfolio because that's the market portfolio. And I, like I said, I've, I've sprinkled in some foreign stocks there. But that's the idea. Now, thinking about that and knowing what you know about diversification, does it make sense for you to go out and try to pick stocks? You go out and you find, you get a, so you don't own a single stock. And on the way home today, you go to get a haircut and the, the lady that cuts your hair says, oh, by the way, and she gives you a hot stock tip. And you say, woohoo! And you say, wait a minute. I'm a master's in business student. I should look at the financial statements first. And you look at the financial statements and you do a few ratios because after all you're bored and you know chapter three, right? And you say, it looks good to me. And you buy it. You are now horribly undiversified, right? Because you only got one stock. 
It doesn't make any sense to go out and pick stocks. I'm going to say this like 17 times throughout the semester, but it doesn't make any sense to go out and pick stocks. And we'll get to even more evidence why that is here shortly. Questions? Yes? Can you explain um, number three on line one? Number three on line one. Okay, so uh, basically, don't be freaked out by the fact that the blue ink doesn't keep going. So what would portfolio three look like? Well, first of all, we know it's suboptimal, right? Because you could go from that area and go straight up and intersect line two and invest at that point and have the same amount of risk and a boatload more return. And the reason that is is because line one is suboptimal because it is not the steepest line that also makes contact with the blue field, right? And so we know that investing anywhere along line one is a bad idea. Why do they throw line one out there? So we can tell you, uh, we can explain why we crank this thing up to where it just touches at one point. Does that make sense? Yeah. But can you explain the, so the 140% in stocks is to the balance the negative 40 in the risk rate? Yeah, which means you're borrowing money at the risk-free rate. So in order to have a negative risk-free assets, you have to be Borrow. Borrow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So remember that oh, you're welcome. when you invest in a risk free asset, you are loaning money. And so when you make a risk free asset, basically you're borrowing money. Um, Ms. Do you have a question? Yeah. Did you see a market portfolio somewhere else around? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The market portfolio is point A. I want you to write market portfolio and draw an arrow. Remember, I said it's the, it's the special portfolio where this line is just tangent to. And so point A is where it is just tangent to. Tangent means touching at only one point. Good question. Other questions? Okay. Now let's talk about news and stock prices. By the way, we've talked about expected returns on stocks, and expected returns on stocks need to be positive. By the way, if a stock had an expected return, a negative expected return, would you want to invest in it? Probably not. We'll talk about a, a case, a weird case, where you might. But uh, we know it, that if there was no information that moved that stock one way or the other, that every day it would just improve, the, uh, increase the stock price by the expected return. But we know that's not what happens. And here's why. Information impacts stock returns. Imp information impacts stock returns. If there's a piece of news that's good for a company, what do you think happens to the stock price? It goes up. So for instance, oil prices jump by 20%. What happens to Chevron's stock price? Goes up. What happens, by the way, to Delta Airlines stock price when oil price goes up 20%? Down. Yeah, down, why? Because flights will be more expensive. Yeah, flights will be more expensive because fuel is one of their big costs. In fact, fuel and labor go neck and neck trying to figure out who's more expensive for airlines. And so it's the news that pushes these stock prices around. And not only is it just news in general, it's unexpected news. Unexpected news. And you say, wait a minute, isn't all news unexpected? No. So let's talk about, uh, we'll, we'll narrow it down to, to stocks here. Uh, a lot of times uh, people will express an expectation for what the earnings per share are going to be. These people are called equity analysts and they have the consensus earnings estimate which is where we take all these analyst estimates and average them to come up with the uber swag of what the earnings for that stock are going to be. Now let's say that that estimate is $1. If the company reports exactly $1 in earnings on their earnings announcement day, have we, have we really had any unexpected news? No, that was totally expected. And so in theory, the stock price should not move at all. Okay, now what about if they announce that they earned $1.04? dollar of that was expected. How much was unexpected? 0.04. Yeah, 0 0.04. And that is a positive 0 0.04. What should that do to the stock price? Yeah, it's going to go up, right? 
What if instead they announce that they're going to have earnings per share of 96 cents per share? Is that higher or lower than what was expected? That's lower. So we've got a dollar of expected earnings and negative 0.04 of unexpected earnings. As a result, the stock price goes down. Does that make sense? Now let's talk about how fast this information gets put into the stock price. It's, it's within a matter of seconds or minutes. So when I, when I started out investing, I was a mechanical engineer. And if you know any engineers, the first thing you know about them is that they think they know everything, right? And after all, I knew some of you bozo business majors when I was in engineering school, and I knew, I knew, I knew I was smarter, right? I should say, I thought. OK, so there I am, and I was starting to make some money. And so I think, what should I do? And so I get a, a subscription to Business Week magazine. Business Week magazine. And once per week, Business Week would uh, run this article that was talked about basically where you should invest your money. Now that article got published first online and then I showed up in my mailbox somewhere around 1.30 in the afternoon, but I was at work. So by the time I got home and sat down to read my Business Week magazine, the information that was in there, if there was any real information at all, had already been baked into the stock price. I bought stock one time based on the information from Business Week. The company ended up going bankrupt. I'm not going to say that's going to happen every time. Now let's talk about an insider trading scheme that happened with Business Week. Remember I told you Business Week would publish things you should invest in now. There was actually a scam where uh, a guy got a job at the company that prints Business Week. And he would look up the stock tickers that they said you should buy. And then he would call his friend on his break and he would say, tell him which ones. and that. Uh, that guy the very next morning at the opening of the market would buy all those stocks and then would because the as other people read the article and started also buying all that information what's going to happen to the stock price that's going to go up and then by the end of the day basically this guy would just sell now the SEC starts noticing this pattern that every week this person is buying and, and by the way do you think they have records to your transactions absolutely so now there are two people in jail as a result, or there were two people in jail as a result of that. The guy who was picking up the phone and calling him, and also the guy that was trading on the information. Questions? Okay, so why do I tell you that? By the time you hear about news, it's probably already impounded into the price, and so you're not going to be able to trade on that news. Um, right now, we've got hedge funds who use artificial intelligence, and it actually is designed to, as soon as something comes out on the news wire, which is how companies release data, as soon as something comes out on the news wire, the artificial intelligence scans the article and comes up with a buy or sell based on what's in the article. And so you can actually make some decent returns if you've got a machine that can think and transact fast enough. I guarantee you, you do not. So what does this mean? It means now it's not a matter of a few seconds or a few minutes. It's a matter of a few milliseconds before the information gets impounded into the stock price. So don't try to read news articles and invest based on them because the information is already old and stale by the time you act. Okay, now let's talk about two types of risk. Um, the first we're going to talk about are called systematic risk. And systematic risk affect most or all assets. Systematic risk affects most or all assets. So let's talk about some systematic risk. What do you think about oil price? Do you think oil price is a systematic risk? Yeah, our entire world economy runs on this stuff whether we like it or not. And so uh, these companies I told you about, Chevron and, um, and Delta, and we discussed why those people are impacted. What about a company that makes cheap plastic toys? Would they be impacted by oil prices? 
Say again? Oh, no. I, I'll tell you why. Um, and I, I'm, I'm demonstrating here that it is a systematic risk oil price. Um, what's the raw material for plastics? Yeah, oil and natural gas, right? And so when you uh, have higher oil prices, you've got higher prices for the raw material. Additionally, how do the plastic toys get from the factory to the retailer? Yeah, in a truck that burns diesel, which comes from oil. Does that make sense? And so you can look and basically, in fact, even here at the university, do you think the university uh, uses oil? Yeah, I mean, have you seen all those worn out pickup trucks they drive around to pick up your garbage? Okay, so they do use that. So we're all impacted by this price of oil until we can find some way to get away from it. What about the decisions of the Federal Reserve? Systematic. Yeah, it's going to be systematic. And so let's talk about uh, just from your own life. First of all, what's going on right now? Starts with an I. You've noticed the prices of things going up. Yeah, inflation. Now, let's talk about where that inflation came from. It comes from two places. One is the um, fiscal stimulus that we had. And the other is a, uh, the monetary stimulus, which is where the Federal Reserve was expanding the money supply. So the Federal Reserve was not only involved in creating inflation, now they are tasked with killing it off. And how do you kill off inflation? Raise interest rates. Yeah, you raise interest rates. And is, so let's talk about what all that impacts. If a company was going to borrow money to go out and buy a new machine, now it's going to be more expensive. If you were going to go out and borrow money to buy a new house, now it's going to be more expensive. Um, what about the, the flip side of this, with interest rates going up? Uh, what does it do to people like my mom? My mom loves these certificates of deposit. What's it done to the returns on her certificates of deposit? It's gone up, right? It's a systematic thing. By the way, it doesn't have to impact all assets the same way. We've been giving examples here where it makes life better for some and worse for others. It just has to impact all or most. Now. Unsystematic risks are risks that affect a single asset or a small group of assets. We also call those uh, unique or asset specific, and there's another name for them. Idiosyncratic. So I'll go ahead and write these out together so you'll see them all. So, so firm specific. specific. And uh, asset specific. And then uh, we're also going to see that this is diversifiable. And then, on the other hand, we have the systematic. Oh, I should have also said unsystematic here. we also call market risk because it's a risk that impacts the entire market and we call this undiversifiable. So remember if it's systematic it's undiversifiable, if it's unsystematic then it's diversifiable. That's how I remember that. They're, they're just flipped. Okay, so let's talk about some things and discuss whether they would be systematic or unsystematic risks. Are you guys familiar with Anheuser-Busch? What does Anheuser-Busch make? Beer. Beer. Okay. Uh, we have a distributorship here locally called Will Fisher. And they do a great job of distributing Anheuser-Busch products. What if, God forbid, what if there was a terrible earthquake and it just swallowed up Will Fisher's distributing center, nothing else, just poof. In fact, we have these things called sinkholes around here and they'll just do that. They'll just, the, the ground will just open up and swallow you. I mean, if you didn't have enough to be scared of, now you know to watch for sinkholes, right? Open up and swallow you. Okay, now, would that be a systematic or unsystematic risk? 
it's going to be unsystematic because it's only affecting that one firm. Now, why is it possible for me to diversify away that unsystematic risk? Well, all I've got to do is buy stock in all of the dis uh, distributorships because whatever profits are being lost by Will Fisher are going to be gained by the other distributorships who come in to keep our coolers filled while we wait for Will Fisher to rebuild. By the way, you didn't think Anheuser-Busch was going to let Springfield go dry, did you? No, they're going to immediately open up the territories of the other distributorships. If you own the stock in them, you're going to make additional profit from them to offset that money you're losing from Will Fisher. Does that make sense? That's why we can diversify away from this sort of stuff. Let's talk about another unsystematic risk. Think about movie theater or movie studios. Movie studios. Movie studios, their, uh, their income is, is largely dependent on how good their last movie was. Does that make sense? And so you could invest in one movie theater and they could have, or movie studio, and they could have a horrible, horrible movie. But how can you uh, get away from that? Well, you invest in all of the movie studios because undoubtedly not everyone's going to have a bad movie at the same time, right? Uh, so example of bad movies, Paul Blart, Mall Cop, right? You guys seen that? Oh, oh, good for you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you could have these blockbusters, and it could be the same studio. You could do, uh, by the way, is Avatar Water or something or other out yet? Okay. So uh, let's just use one that we know did well, Top Gun Maverick. That one did really well. Now, those people could put out Paul Blart Mall Cop 4 tomorrow. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's totally a firm specific thing and we can, we can diversify away from that. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about diversification and portfolio risk. I'm gonna to explain to you what's going on in this picture. We have over here on the left hand column, the number of stocks in the portfolio. And what happened is these uh, finance guys, um, Elton and Gruber, what they did, uh, they went out and they trained a robot. And they told the robot, uh, we're going to tell you a number of stocks to go out and pick at random. And bless you. Then we want you to form a portfolio of those stocks. And then we're going to want you to determine what's the standard deviation of returns for that portfolio. And we want you to do that 10,000 times. This is called a Monte Carlo simulation, I think. Anyway, so they went out and they said, okay, robot, first thing I want you to do is make a portfolio of one stock. It's pretty easy. You just go out and pick a stock, you hold it up to the light, and you say, oh, standard deviation of returns is 27.9. And you throw it back. And you do that 9,999 more times. And when you do that, the average uh, standard deviation of returns was 49.24%. That is our average expectation for an undiversified portfolio. That's our average expectation for an undiversified portfolio. And that's going to be the baseline that we judge all the rest of these portfolios by because we're going to be talking about how far under that can we go based on the number of stocks we hold in the portfolio. So now, let's double that. And we tell the uh, computer to go out and pick two stocks at random and build a portfolio 50-50 and tell me what is the standard deviation of that portfolio and do that 10,000 times. And when the computer did, they came up with 37.36%. Is that lower than the portfolio of one? Yeah. And that means it is less risky. It means we've gotten rid of some risk. That's diversification. And look at that. If, if we go over here and we divide everything by that baseline amount, then of course up at the top we've got one. And down the next one down, when we've doubled, we are down to 76% of the original risk of the one asset portfolio. We were able to get rid of 24% of the risk by just holding two stocks instead of one. That's pretty cool. Now, forget numbers, uh, the, the one that says six. Let's go on and double one more time to eight. If we double one more time to eight, then we're down to 24.98, which brings us down to, uh, what, 
five, one. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped four. So then if we go to four, we're down to 29.69%, which is 60% of that original amount. Now here's what I want you to notice. The first doubling dumped 24% of the risk. That second doubling only dumped an additional 16%. And that's the way it's gonna be all the way out. It's, it's called diminishing, uh, diminishing returns to doing this, right? We're getting less and less benefit from adding each one, but we still get benefit. And so when we double again to eight, it dumps another 9%, so we're down to 51. When we double again to 16, it's not on there, but we can go up to 20 and we're down to 0.44, which is only down uh, 0.07 from the last level that we looked at. And so that's what's gonna happen. Let me draw that picture for you. In fact, I don't even think I have to draw a picture. I think I have a picture. So here we go. Oh, there we go. We have a picture. Okay. So this is exactly what was on that last slide. We have up here at the top, we have 49.2. That is the average expected standard deviation of returns for a portfolio with one stock. And you notice down here on the horizontal axis, we have the number of stocks in the portfolio. And we can see that as that number of stocks goes up, then uh, this, this risk goes down. But it doesn't go down at a constant rate. It goes down at a declining rate and it becomes asymptotal. Asymptotal. An asymptote is a curve that gets closer and closer to a line but never quite reaches it. See, you can think of an airplane that's coming in for a landing and every uh, kilometer move, it moves forward, it drops half the remaining altitude. If it continues to drop half the remaining altitude, it's going to get closer and closer and closer to the ground, but will it ever touch? No, because we're always just dropping half the remaining altitude. You'll never get there. And that's what's going on here. As we add more and more stocks to our portfolio, that total risk, which is the top line, that total risk gets lower and lower and lower until it almost touches this thing that we now know is non-diversifiable or systematic risk. And so there's a certain amount of risk that regardless of how many stocks you put in there, you're not going to get rid of. So that non-diversifiable risk is also known as market risk, is also known as systematic risk, which we talked about earlier. Uh, this diversifiable risk is the part between total risk, which is that curved line, and the non-diversifiable risk. And how do we know it's diversifiable? Because we can add more stocks and get rid of it. Now, here's a trick question. Uh, it's not really tricky, but students miss it all the time. And that is, if I have a well-diversified portfolio, does it help to add one more stock that's not perfectly positively correlated? And the answer is yes. Now, does it help as much as going from one stock to two? No. Does it help as much as going from two to four? No. But going from 10,000 to 10,001 still helps. It just helps less than the earlier additional stock. And so frankly, any time that I see a new uh, stock out there, uh, in theory, I would want to add it to my portfolio because after all, I'm pretty darn sure that it's not perfectly positively correlated to this uh, market portfolio that I've been holding. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about how many stocks you need to have in your portfolio to be well diversified. Just look, let's go back up here. Uh, and, and look at the percentages. Where does the percentage start to be the same over and over and over again? Yeah, about 200. And what that means is that the difference is out there at the third and fourth decimal place. And those are still different. We're still going down. But we have whacked out the overwhelming majority of the risk by the time we get to 200. Um, I'm holding 1,100 stocks right now. I'm actually over 1,100. So I'm really well diversified, if you, if you want to think about this situation. Now, 
Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, my dad and I talk. My dad has his portfolio of stocks, and I said, so how many do you have in your portfolio? He says, oh, it's really well diversified. And I said, how many do you have? And he says, 10. Is dad well diversified? No. And then he says something beyond that. He says, but it's okay because I'm entirely in electrical utility stocks. If you're going to, uh, even if you had 200 stocks, but they were all in the same industry, would that be as well diversified as if you had 200? No. And by the way, do I know which industries are going to do well and which ones are going to do poorly? No. Roll back to, oh bless you. So roll back, roll back to uh, January of 2020. Do you guys remember back before we'd ever seen a mask? We were all happy, and you go out and you do stuff, and you have fun. And by the way, how much did you care about Zoom at that point? Very little. And then suddenly, whoof, we've got COVID-19. Now, things that used to matter to us, like going out to restaurants, going to nightclubs, suddenly are in the dumper. Things that didn't matter to us before, Zoom, and I, that toilet paper's always mattered, but it mattered like a whole lot more, right? So those things suddenly become more important. So if you had been invested totally in nightclubs and restaurants at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19, you'd have been in a world of hurt. And if you'd been invested totally in Zoom and whatnot, you would have been really great. Now roll forward three years. What do you think's happened to the stocks of Zoom and all those other things as time's gone on? Yeah, they've gone down. And what do you think's happened to prices of uh, stock prices of companies that we shunned during the pandemic? They're back, right? So you can't know unless you can predict the future, which, by the way, if you can, Kona Bobs will get rich together. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't know. So what does that mean? It means I should own stocks in all of them. Now, let's talk about ESG investing. You guys know what ESG stands for? How many of you are believers in ESG investing? You can tell I'm being sarcastic here, so no one's going to confess. Environment, social, governance, right? Okay. Now, I understand the whole governance thing because you don't want to give your money to crooks. I get that. And I can exclude poorly governed uh, companies from my portfolio and still be well diversified. But when I start demanding that uh, companies have adopted a zero carbon pledge or that they support uh, certain social movements, uh, the number of people of companies that meet those criteria get really small really fast. So. What would that mean if I had taken the pledge to only do ESG investing? What would that mean to the number of stocks in my portfolio? It's going to be smaller. Mr. Ali, what does that mean for my diversification? Less diversification. Yeah, less diversification. And as a result, you're taking on more risk than you need to. So do you think the whole like, ESG score thing is kind of... Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so let's just momentarily here. Where are we figuring out whether companies are ESG or not? Well, some group somewhere puts a, uh, a, does a, an audit to determine whether or not they're worthy. Well, by the way, who pays the groups to audit them? The companies themselves, right? And so these groups have, first of all, they have an incentive to want to find good things, right? Because then this encourages other people to hire them too. So that's, and by the way, these people typically don't declare the fact that they're capitalists, but they are, right? Because after all, they're selling these ratings. Okay, number two, um, what about, let's see here. Oh, these uh, carbon offsets. It's a freaking shell game, people. It's a shell game. Um, I think I posted a Wall Street Journal article about it. If I didn't, I should. Uh, it's uh, basically, th these people are creating these carbon credits by, by buying a bunch of trees that they weren't going to cut down anyway. They buy those trees and now they're like, oh hey, these trees soak up 100 tons of CO2 a year, therefore I'm entitled to this much money. Have they really done anything to reduce 
the carbon? No, no. But when companies invest in those carbon offsets, guess what? Then they get to call themselves E, right? Environmental. And so uh, I, I think one thing is that people are starting to wise up to this whole shell game. Um, and that these uh, firms, you, you would be surprised to learn that they had higher returns and lower risk than the rest of the market for the last few years. And I think the reason is that uh, there was a clientele of people who wanted to invest in those things, and so they put their money into it. Well, what does that do to the share price? Well, it just makes it climb steadily, steadily as more and more people put their money in. Well, now that people are kind of spotting the shell game, what's going to happen to the prices of those stocks? Yeah, they're going to go down, and they're going to become actually more risky than the overall market. So those are my two predictions. Over the next five years, you'll see ESG stocks return worse than the market, and they'll be riskier than the overall market. My prediction, five years from now, feel free to send me an email that says, nanny, nanny, boo boo, you were wrong. Uh, undoubtedly, if I'm right, I won't hear from you. Questions? By the way, when you guys don't invest in a company because they're out there drilling for oil, what does that mean? It pushes the share price of that company down, right? Who goes out there and buys it? Someone's going to go out there and buy that thing, right? And they're going to get a better return as a result. You're going out and buying the nicey nice companies and driving up the share price, and then the next person that buys in has to pay a higher share price, means they're going to get lower returns. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about measures of risk. Remember we said standard deviation is a measure of total risk. Total risk is systematic plus unsystematic. That's all total risk is. It's both those things put together. And so uh, it turns out that the market is only concerned about systematic risk. And I'll show you why the market's only concerned about systematic risk. Remember at the end of chapter four we said that the present or the price or value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows discounted at a risk appropriate to the risk, adjusted at a rate appropriate to the risk. Okay, so here we go. And you're going to go out there. You're totally undiversified. And so you're bearing total risk. As a result, your required rate of return is going to be higher, which means the present value of that stock to you is going to be lower. Right? Because as this thing on the bottom gets bigger, this thing gets smaller. Now, what about me? I am a well-diversified investor. I have a, I only have to bear the systematic risk, and so my required return is much lower. And so as a result, I can always outbid you. I can always outbid you for the same asset because you, you can't afford to pay as much for it and get the return for the risk that you're bearing. And so as a result, the on, only the systematic risk gets priced into the market because the market's like a continuing auction. Now, does that mean you, the undiversified investor, can't go out there and buy the shares for the same thing that I can? Absolutely you can't. But you are not going to get return that is commensurate to the risk that you're taking. You're only going to get return commensurate to the systematic risk. So the market is only concerned about systematic risk. And so our measurement of systematic risk is something called beta. And it's uh, this is curly B looking thing. It's a Greek letter. That's our measure of systematic risk. And how do we find beta? Well, we look at, by the way, this is the second line of the day, right? The first one was the capital market line. This one is the characteristic line, and every stock out there has a characteristic line. Because all you do is you take the return on the market, which is this horizontal axis. And by the way, what did I say we use as the return on the market in the U.S.? What return would we use? No. <laughs> yeah, the S&P 500 is going to give us the return on the market, right? Okay, so that's horizontal axis. And then we've got the return on the stock is the vertical axis. And then we're just going to plot those things. And then we're going to look at the slope on the line. 
The slope on the line is beta. Beta is the slope of the characteristic line. Beta is the slope of the characteristic line. Now in this case, the slope of the line is 1.5. That means for every percent that, for every percent the market goes up, that this stock is gonna go up how much? Yeah, 1.5%. And so, uh, and this, this sounds great. You're like, wait a minute, what if the market goes up 2%? And then you say, well, that means that the stock's gonna go up 3%, right? Two times 1.5. Now, let's talk about what happens when beta gets larger and larger. Uh, let's talk about a beta of three. If the market is up 1%, how much is the stock up? One times three is three, right? And you're saying, wow! This is pretty cool. I want to have the highest beta stocks possible because when the market's up 1%, they're going to be up a bunch. What's the fallacy with that thinking? Does the market always go up? No. What happens when the market goes down? Well, when the market goes down and you've got a beta of three, if the market's down 1%, you're down 3%. If the market's down 2%, you're down 6%. And so having a high beta stock is good in good times. It's bad in bad times. Questions? Now, by the way, if I look at, I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate here uh, interpretive dance. This is the market and this is the stock. If I've got a stock here with a beta of one half, when the market's up two, this thing's up one, when the market's down two, this thing's down one. And so now beta of one half. We see that this stock is moving very little compared to the market. Remember our roughness as, as risk? Remember the, the rougher the line is, the riskier it was? This thing's not very risky at all because it's got a low beta. But what about uh, the stock with a beta of three? The market's up 2%, this thing's up 6%. The market's down 2%, this thing's down 6%. So you see this thing is swinging far more widely than the overall market. It's riskier, riskier. So what we're saying is high beta, the higher the beta, the riskier it is, and therefore the more reward you have to get to hold on to this thing. So let's talk about betas for some selected stocks. First of all, American Electric Power, what do you guess they do? Electric. Yeah, they make electric electricity. And uh, what you'll notice is they've got a very low beta. And here's why. So think about this. It, it starts over here with the economy. If the economy is in good shape, how does that affect the market for their goods? Well, back when we were an industrialized nation, um, it was uh, electricity went with the economy a lot. But now, most of the electricity in the United States isn't used for industry. What's it used for? You guys like air conditioning? Yeah, do you like light? That's, it's residential electricity is what it's mainly used for now. Now, the question is this. Do you go home when times are good and say, wow, times are going really great. Uh, I think I'll turn on some more lights. No, uh, I think I'll just turn on that electric oven and open the door and just waste electricity because times are great. No. People don't do that. Now, on the downside, do you think people show up when they're like, ah, oh, damn, the market was down 5% today. Better turn off some lights. It doesn't work that way. And so what we see is that the beta is very low for electric utilities. This is one of the reasons my dad says his portfolio is safe. It's because he's got um, primarily these low beta stocks. And he's absolutely right about that, but he's still having to bear systemat unsystematic risk that he shouldn't have to bear. Okay, now moving on to Johnson & Johnson. What does Johnson & Johnson make? Baby products. Say again? Baby products? Yeah. And so um, they're making baby shampoo and stuff like that. Uh, baby powder, which they got in trouble for. Uh, if you don't know what that's about, look it up. Uh, what else do they make? Clothing products. Clothing. Say again? Covid injections. Yeah, so they're basically making medical supplies. <laughs> So uh, let's, let's, call, let's talk about bandages. Do you think people say, oh damn, I just cut my finger and it's bleeding excessively. Economic times are really good. I should probably bandage that up. No. Do they say, 
Oh, damn, I just cut my finger and it's bleeding excessively. <sighs> I wish the market were doing better or I'd bandage that thing up. It doesn't work that way. And so that's why Johnson & Johnson is a relatively low beta stock. What about Tyson Foods? Tyson Foods, what's their primary product? Chicken. Chicken. Um, when, uh, so do you ever hear anybody say, hey honey, I just got a big promotion at work. Let's go out for chicken. No. I mean, you might be into that, but most people, if they get a promotion, what's the meat of choice? Steak, Steak right? Okay, so uh, we could see that even between a chicken company and a beef company, you would expect different betas. Now let's talk about why beef is more of a luxury good. It takes four pounds of feed to put one pound of meat on a chicken. It takes 10 pounds of feed to put one pound of meat on a cow. So, it's really, it's what, two and a half times more expensive to, to create a pound of beef, therefore the price per pound of beef is higher, uh, therefore uh, beef is a luxury good, and so the beta on it's probably going to be higher. Does that make sense? All states and insurance company, um, roughly, by the way, what do you think is the beta for the overall market? One. One. And she's absolutely right, and here's why. If the market's up by 1%, how much is the market up? Yeah, it's only comparing to itself, right? If the market's down 3%, the market's down 3%. Okay, so Allstate is a little less uh, than the overall market. It's an insurance company, 3M. 3M makes basically a whole lot of different things. 3M itself is a pretty boring company and they make a huge diversified amount of products. It doesn't surprise me that they're only about as risky as the overall market. Hewlett Packard, what do they do? And they do uh, computer stuff, right? And uh, you think about computers, uh, do people buy more computers in good times? Yeah. Do they buy fewer computers in bad times? They do. So for example, um, when uh, financial crises hit, people put off replacing all the computers in the office until times are better. So we know that Hewlett Packard is gonna be more risky than the overall market, and the same is true with Dell. Dell does the same thing. Now the last one on here is a little bit of a weirdo. It's the American International Group. And this snapshot was taken, and I forget what year, but it was uh, shortly after the financial crisis. So here's what AIG did. They made a bunch of bad bets leading up to the financial crisis, and basically they should have been bankrupt, but the government deemed them, deemed them to be too big to fail. So they jumped in, and in exchange for equity in the firm, basically they saved it. Too big to fail, they thought if it went down the hill, if, they, if it went down the hole, everyone would go with it. Okay, so the government saves it, but Guess what? Afterwards, the, the, uh, the shares of AIG are just really beat up. And so then as they recovered and it became more clear they were going to survive, what do you think happened to the stock price? It starts climbing. Now, it climbs really fast because it was growing from such a low level. If uh, they had not been impacted by the financial crisis as they were, their beta would have looked more like Allstate, 0.88. Allstate, by the way, didn't do anything stupid during the financial crisis, and so uh, they didn't enjoy that quick rise afterward. Questions? So would you say the beta is, seems to be larger for companies that have like a more specified or smaller area? I guess? I think that beta is dependent on the industry. And so if you had a small tech firm and a big tech firm that were doing the same thing, they would have the same beta. Okay, I didn't get through the last of the math on this, so go ahead and try what you can on the practice and the homework, but I will go ahead and push the due date out on the homework. I'll send out an announcement.